Details We're in Idaho. With those uh, murders in Idaho, the new details about the man accused of killing four students at the University of Idaho. Suspect Brian Koberger appeared in an Idaho courtroom oh, for the I very first time yesterday. This. And in newly unsealed court documents, police say they identified him, getting into the details, also getting into how they linked him to the crime scene. Also, a chilling affidavit alleges That's that so one of the surviving roommates saw a masked man she did not know walk past her bedroom door, door the morning of the murders. Omar Villafranca has more now from Moscow, Idaho, but a warning here in a quadruple murder story. Some of these details are disturbing. Murder suspect Brian Koberger smiled at his public defender as he faced a judge in Idaho for the first time Thursday. Count two alleges that you committed the felony offense of murder in the first degree. The maximum penalty for that offense, if you plead guilty or are found guilty, is up to death and or imprisonment up for life. Death. Do you understand? I mean, yes. yeah, it's fucking Idaho. He's they don't fuck around. Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Shapin to death in the early morning hours of November 13th. According to a newly unsealed 18-page affidavit, investigators discovered DNA on a knife sheath similar to this one found on the How bed next him? to Madison Mogan. Him? Yeah. They linked that the DNA. Bodies? He just left him there and he walked out. Oh, you don't know the details he then. Them on the so basically, still. this is like, as far as we know, uh, from what we understand, like this is a criminology PhD. At, uh, he's a PhD? Yeah, he has a criminology what? PhD. He's conducted uh, Reddit surveys on like the, the psychological profile of like criminals. He's asked criminals like why you did the crime. You know, did you think yeah. about the victims? That sort of stuff. And and he is, yeah, he he uh, circled the night of the murder. He circled <coughs> with his car, turned his phone off, circled the, uh, circled the house, like the block of the house, four times, literally went into the house at like around 4 a.m. Not exactly, uh, not exactly sure on when he, I, yeah, he's a PhD student. What the fuck? What Wait, do you guys want? Did he, I not he, say that? He, he, you did. He's studying criminology just to do these dumbass crimes, like, like, to get caught like this. You know what I mean? Like, well, he said he'd be a little more. Yeah, Dexter. I mean, he was not. He was not as uh, as as Dexter like as he would think he is. I mean, he turned off his phone. He did some basic stuff. Just leaving bodies like, on the. But campus. like, he used. But he used a knife. So like, you know, he he left his DNA on on scene, and there were people who were awake at the time. So he walks into done this. That better. He walks into this house, uh, he stabs four people at, to death, and two of them are, like, you know, in a room. Stop saying he did it. Allegedly. Okay, allegedly. You're right. Um, stabs four people to death, even though his... So what do you mean? All, he, stop saying he did it. Motherfucker, his DNA is on the scene, dog. What the fuck? Wait, he killed them all at the same time? Uh, yeah, that is, like, actually the unique component here because, like, he got caught basically uh -huh. by one of the roommates who uh didn't understand what was going on and thought like maybe one of her roommates was like, playing with her dog or something opens the door opens the door again and he uh, uh, hears him saying like oh i'll help you i can help you and then opens the door again sees him like randomly with bushy eyebrows and shit wearing a black mask uh, uh and and she closes the door locks it he's like worried but it's like they're drunk it's a fucking party house they you know, plenty of random so weird sus bro. people walk in and out of houses like that. So she yeah. probably might have not thought more about it. We don't know. Uh, so did he know them? Like, what the fuck is going on here? We don't know, uh, but it also, doesn't like, seem like he, he this does. man has gone through his whole life PhD, and then he's just walking into a random house and stabbing everyone. Yeah, it's just so bizarre and disturbing. Um. So, oh, yeah, there's another detail. He was likely stalking or seeing one of the victims at night. His phone pinged around the house 12 oh, times shit. since June. Either way, he was consistently scoping out the place. Um, and, and uh, you know, he, he went in. Uh, he stabbed before people to death. He was caught by one of, the, one of the other survivors. He just basically walked out. And he literally drove away, you know, linked up with his dad, they did a cross-country tour to Pennsylvania. He got caught in Pennsylvania eventually. DNA to Koberger by matching it to his father's oh, DNA found freak. in the trash outside the family home. Yeah, his, uh, matching it to the father's DNA outside of the trash in the family home. This is important. This is a, one of the new details. Knife sheath, similar to this one, found on the bed next to Madison Mogan. They linked he that left the DNA sheath to Koberger that's by matching to it to his father's DNA point? found I mean, in the trash. Like, yeah, and like, then... 
And then brutal. they link the knife sheath DNA to his dad. So he basically took his dad's knife and killed them. Is what what you know the uh, speculation? No, wait, is. that's so. Uh, they they found the sheath. They swapped it for DNA. So what? His dad has a record or something? I mean, if he's uh, twenty two and me. Oh, his dad did a twenty two and me. Not his dad, but like e- e- even if an immediate family member uh, has like. Or no, 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 not twenty three and me. They they looked at his trash, right? They got his DNA from the trash. Uh, yeah, they took it. they took his dad uh, dad's said, DNA. This, guy, but, this DNA is the parent of whoever. But I I thought it was originally from the ancestry tree, like one of the. Tw- so he did, <coughs> he did do it pretty slick. Like I mean, the DNA <coughs> the DNA forensic they can do now is like insane. It's so hard to get away with murder these days. Like I mean, what they did against the gold. They killer re- like a few years ago. They un- they fucking yeah. They that did that. Was. Yeah, they did it through ancestry. Yeah, they linked the sheath to DNA, and then the trash showed DNA of the father <laughs> or uh, or of whoever owned the knife sheath. Yeah, ten years ago they would have never caught him. Yeah, or maybe fifteen. I don't know how. Recently. They just said the trash collected the DNA proved that the DNA in the knife was ninety nine point nine 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 percent is the son Dude, of the DNA. I'm in the so trash. glad. I personally, people think it's like dystopian. I love it, bro. I, I think about like think the ethical awesome. the the implications on like uh, how easily like I mean I don't know I, I I worry I worry about that because it's like not one hundred percent and you can uh, a lot of people Pretty assume close. that it's like one hundred percent I I fear Genetics? that genetics when has anyone ever been um, tried over like a, ge- a genetic take I don't think I've ever heard of that well a lot of people have actually. Uh, been declared innocent as a consequence of that. You're right, yeah. but yeah, that, exactly. I don't know. It's just there's something that I that are, there's something that I worry about with respect to like uh you know being able to basically uh, like scour the DNA uh footprint or like the DNA genealogy of like every single immediate family member. <laughs> like that. Well, I don't. What's so so? I get it's like a little dystopian, but. What is it you're afraid of happening exactly with that information? I think that I worry that like uh, the more we use it, the more it's going to be used in like normal circumstances and not like murder. You know what I mean? It starts off with murder profiles and that's fine. But then and everybody like kind of gets used to it. (coughs) And then it turns into it turns into a problem when like, uh, you know, companies are using it or or uh, you know, insurance companies are basically using it to like you know drive up your rates and shit like that. Like there will be commercial they, use for this that I fear. Here, I'll give you a great yeah, example. Give me an example. Cameras and CCTV footage is like uh, you know made it definitely easier to catch criminals in the act. One of the latest things that happened with face tracking technology and cameras everywhere was that there was a law firm that was suing Madison Square Garden. Have you, have you heard of the story? A law firm is suing Madison Square Garden. I forget what, what the details are exactly. But one of the fucking parents of a school trip that is going to Madison Square Garden, one of the parents that is a part of that law firm that's not even involved in the case directly was caught on face trackers entering Madison Square Garden and they literally stopped her from entering Madison Square Garden. They're like, you know, there's, a, there's an ongoing uh, active lawsuit and you are a part of this law firm. You can't fucking come in here with your, with your child. I, I have reservations about the face tracking just because it's not super, it's not always accurate, right? Like that, that one definitely has, that one definitely is not reliable enough to convict people. And I've heard of that shit going sideways and wrong people getting convicted yeah. on face tracking. But DNA is, is as close to a hundred percent as you know. I mean, the records. face tracker is a hundred percent as well. I'm just saying no, that not. like, it's not, no, 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 no. The utility of it. Do you understand? The utility doesn't stay. My point wasn't about like 100%. My point was the utility of a certain thing can come across as like smart and good originally. And then I can uh, totally see it being used for commercial reasons by like incredibly powerful corporations in the way that I just described to you. So I I fear that like DNA sampling like this is going to be used as like a it, it used to like have access to just like the widespread, pretty much like information that is, uh, you know, written in your fucking genes is going to be accessible to like every corporation that wants to pay for it eventually. And that is something that I uh, am fearful of. I guess it's inevitable. Anyway. Regardless, eh? Yeah. 
So DNA leads to higher insurance rates uh, for cancer predisposition could lead to lower yeah, credit sucks. scores for people. You know what I mean? Like that's like that's Gattaca. Fu- yeah. Gattaca. If, if insurance companies are crunching the numbers, analyzing your DNA, that's pretty fucked up. But get it. Wasn't I'm not yeah. about like designer babies and shit. Yes, but I love that movie. But that way. it also is like about it, Well, we're already doing that with gene editing. But it also was like you, you're predetermined to that. That one has a coding. That one's actually sweet. You'll like that one. It also was about like what capitalism does and and uh, what happens when you, you know, mix capitalism with uh uh you know genetic predetermination, like uh the assumption that like uh, a society run on like the concept of right. genetic superiority and like having access to the to the best kind of gene editing would make you a person who uh, you know was was uh, if you didn't have access to that kind of gene editing you would be deemed uh, a a undesirable person that is happening by the way yeah it's that's they're, what i mean the bleeding edge of like ivf technology is they're already f- kind of figured out how to determine like height eye color yeah. hair texture intelligence so designer baby thing is is coming yeah so that's my point that's what i'm fearful of Anyway, let's continue. Ash outside I guess it's good and bad. Home. It's inevitable. Yeah. And the catching the murderers thing is mm-hmm. dope, but it's going to happen. So. The knife sheath left at the crime scene, which is where they derived the DNA, to me is like a nail in the coffin. Casey the Jordan, a criminologist with no connection to the case, believes the evidence against Koberger is overwhelming citing stunning new details in the affidavit from an interview with the surviving roommate. She told investigators she woke up around 4 a.m. and thought she heard Kaylee Gonsalves say, there's someone here. Later, the roommate said she heard what sounded like crying in Zana Kernodal's room. Then a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you. When she opened her bedroom door, she told investigators she saw a man she did not recognize wearing black clothes and a mask. She described him as 5'10 or taller, male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. She said she stood frozen as the man walked by her to the back door. She then went in her room and locked the door. The affidavit did not explain why police were not called to the scene until noon, about eight hours later. I really do believe that the evidence... Because, like, they... So, a lot of people... This is why people were, like, speculating crazy shit. But, I mean, it makes sense to me to a certain degree. Like, if you're living in, like, a shared living space with a bunch of other college uh, people and you hear someone crying, you just assume, like, oh, there's a fight going on or whatever, right? And you're you're drunk as fuck regardless, right? You're, like... Drunk as fuck, you you pass the fuck out, and then you wake up in the morning and you think, oh my god, someone is like unconscious. One of my roommates is unconscious. That's what they thought originally. Oh, one of my roommates is unconscious. That's why they called nine one one. Evidence is so strong already. Oh. Before the investigation is complete, he's going to have an uphill climb to try to be found not guilty. It's worth noting that investigators laid out several th- threads tying Koberger to the crime scene. Now, police say his cell phone pinged in the area of the crimes at least a dozen times before the attacks. Police also say that a white Hyundai was seen speeding away after the attack. He drives a white Hyundai. From there, police say that they were able to track that car's toll tag from Washington State all the way to Pennsylvania. There in Pennsylvania, they got a DNA sample from his parents' trash bin. That DNA sample linked back to the knife sheath found here in Idaho. A lot of police work was going on. He will remain here in the Laytock County Jail. He'll be in court next week oh, where he'll so enter a plea. Dude. Tony? Yeah. A fucking freak. Wow. I mean, it took some time for police to get that evidence, but there's a lot in this indictment. Uh, Omar, thank you very much. In our next hour, 48 Hours correspondent Peter Van Good Sant will join us nice with a closer look at the suspect. Nice job, and boys. also he'll be... I mean, that, that, we'll, we'll, we'll give that one to the FBI for sure, because uh, from what I understand... The Moscow morning, uh, cops were just basically like twiddling their fucking thumbs for the most part. This this is a lot of like uh, you know post hoc uh, uh, dubs giving to the given to the law enforcement community across the board in an effort, in my opinion, to propagandize and make it seem like they were doing a lot of good uh, work <coughs> when it literally was not the police that was doing this. It was the FBI that was doing uh, a lot of the heavy lifting here. Um, I'll take that dub too. No, I, I mean I'll take it. 
it it was also across lines too. It was across like uh uh you know state lines as well. But like they literally fucking said cops at the time were basically just going, you know, uh yeah, we don't know what's going on. They that's what they said. So she passed out for eight hours. I'm assuming she probably went to sleep or something. That's what I think too, but we don't and know. We don't know the actual died, details. But her. Well, no, no, no. There was a. There were other roommates in the house too. That like, oh, I think wow. they didn't even see him at all. They were just I'm like sleeping. I'm surprised you can stab four people to death. Without that is actually hearing. that is legitimately uh, confusing to me as well. That like, would be loud because he he went into two rooms with two people, implying that he killed at least two people in two separate rooms in front of another person. Right, and if you're being stabbed to death, you're not. You can, you're going to be vocal, right? You're not like immediately dead. Yeah, and there had to have been so much blood, too. Like, oh, it's yeah. just crazy. Fuck that guy. But then again, yes, you are right, Fragile, Frail Golem. Ted Bundy did do that with a rock in a house with multiple people. He did it in a sorority house. Yeah, but Ted Bundy's the best that ever did it. Come on. Dude. Yeah, you know I, I mean, Bundy. not, uh, yeah, you know. He did have a lot of experience. There is another component here, uh, which is, the you know, friend of the show, Moist Critical Charlie's video, who covered... Uh, the other part of this, which is like the more toxic side oh, of this, shit. true oh. crime enthusiasts. They were accusing the roommate. That's so stupid. What? Not the roommate, uh, a, a a teacher as well. There was like a TikTok psychic. There's a bunch of different. They're uh, just blasting people. They were, but, but that's what happens all the time. The we did it Reddit. Remember the Boston bombing, like uh, the right. Boston Marathon bomber. They right. Reddit made it seem like the Reddit thought yeah, that they that had found bad. the actual bomber when it was like some random fucking guy. This has been a, a, a tale as old as time itself. People get incredibly fascinated, especially when there's not a lot of official uh, information out there. And they want to take matters into their own hands. And they <coughs> inevitably end up ruining people's fucking lives in this, like, witch hunt, basically. And TikTok is, TikTok is, is particularly uh, awful with it because, like, true crime, fascinating stuff, right? The human condition... Uh, how can a human being do such an awful thing? We watch some true crime stuff here as well. Usually, you know, cases that have ended, right? Um, and and mostly from the mostly from the perspective of like uh, you know I interviewers, uh, interrogators, and how like suspects behave in interrogations and things like that. Now, having said that, there's also a, a scene that takes it one step further where they are true crime enthusiasts and they behave like the thing that is unfolding in front of them is actually is unfolding uh, as like a movie when it's not. These are real victims. These are real human so beings. You, well, here, I'll let Charlie explain it while I go pee real For quick. online attention on TikTok is a poison more potent than cyanide. We're moving on to new updates from the Idaho murders. The man accused of killing four university students near campus is now in county jail in Idaho. He was handed over to local authorities after a flight from Pennsylvania. Omar Villafranca has more from Moscow, Idaho. Landing in Washington late Wednesday night, 28-year-old Brian Koberger was met by law enforcement on the Pullman Moscow Regional Airport tarmac. He was quickly escorted to the Leda County Jail in Moscow, Idaho, where he was booked on four counts of first-degree murder for allegedly killing Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Shapin in November. Hello. How y'all doing? doing? Koberger's arrival in Idaho came as police released new body cam video of the suspect and his dad being pulled over twice in Indiana on a December road trip home to Pennsylvania. See, he's right up on. Oh, yeah, they stopped them, dude. They fucking stopped them. I think twice, not even once. God, cops are awesome, dude. Man, man. He's right up on the back of that van. Get over for tailgating. Video shows the sheriff's deputy talking with the two about their long drive. So you're coming from Washington State University and you're going there? Uh oh. We're going to be going to the Oh, okay. Yeah, we're going to be driving. Hours. Hours. Days. Hours. More than two weeks. Bro, look at his fucking face. Dude, white man buff is so insane, okay? Like, you get, like, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, if you're, like, if you're a white dude and you're talking to a cop, cops literally cannot comprehend any vibes that are fucked. Sneak plus 10? Try sneak plus 100, dude. That meta is so OP, I swear to God.
It's crazy. Obviously, we've talked about it. Like, it, it, it's OP in general because, like, you know, we live in a society that is designed to, to maintain power in the hands of what is, uh, you know, a never a, an endlessly expanding or sometimes shrinking concept of what white people are. But God damn, dude. I mean, this is like, it's like, it's weird. It's, it's weird. Like, when w police interactions, they're rolling nat 20s every time. Every time. How many fucking serial killers, which by the way, almost all of them are white, but how many serial killers have had moments where they've interacted with cops, like literally with a body in the trunk, literally immediately after a murder, like when they fit the profile of a suspect that they're looking for. It is so overpowered. Jeffrey Dahmer is a, is a example as well. It's not, it's just like, it, it's just a, a, a race passive. You know what I mean? It's crazy. Weeks after this, Koberger was arrested at his family's home in Pennsylvania. The public defender for his extradition case, Jason Labar, described him to 48 hours as calm and intelligent. He's an ordinary man to me. I see no distinct characteristics. He's easy to talk to. He's aware of the situation. He's very calm. What? Koberger is. Dude, this is another, wait, by the way, this is another race buff. This is another racial buff that people don't know about. They also get a plus 10 media buff. A lot of people constantly complain about like, oh, white men are under attack or whatever. But the amount of, they get plus 10 charisma in the eyes of media figures. They never talk about these motherfuckers and, and people who hold institutional power in general, where they like, they talk about a serial killer like he's just some chill dude. Remember, Ted Bundy, one of the most prolific rapist murderers of all time. In the aftermath of the case on Ted Bundy, the judge literally told him as he was delivering his final deliberation, as he was like delivering the final judgment, he said, you are such a fine young man. Perhaps if circumstances were different, it's such a waste of a fine young man. Perhaps if circumstances were different, Perhaps if circumstances were different, you would be in this courtroom defending other, uh, you know, innocent people or something. Um, here is uh, Brian Kohlberger in Latak County, Idaho, the court this morning. No bond. Next hearing in one week. We will go through the probable cause affidavit and timeline. Coming up on News Nation at 5 p.m. Eastern. All right. Later. Okay, well, I'm sorry, Carter. Like, you already know just as well as I do. These towns, they just, they're so fucking weird. Please be seated. Late to, late to. Why are you talking like it's a racial buff? Serial killers are great manipulators. Um... I'm talking about it as a racial buff across the board. If you are like caught, if you're a, a perpetrator of violent crime, uh, the way that black people get presented in media are literally like, oh, look at this fucking animal. Look at his mugshot. He's such a thug. Okay. Versus white serial killers will like murder their whole fucking family and they'll show the family jet skiing uh, in the, in the headline photo as, as Zach Carter has correctly pointed. I mean, Zach Carter, Zach Fox has correctly pointed out here. This is, this is like an, Endless meme, yeah. This is how the photos be looking in the headlines when a white man kills his entire family. I said, Zach Carter. My mom called me on stream and told me to react to this because she knew I went to college there. I read the affidavit on stream to her. Nice. Here was the Ted Bundy seat. Ted Bundy. Today, Ted Bundy sentencing hearing. The jury's recommendation and sentenced Theodore Bundy to die in the electric chair for the murder of two co-eds. Bundy is the 136th person under death sentence in Florida. Ed Rabel reports. Before pronouncing the sentence, Judge Edward Cowart let Bundy make a statement. And I'm not asking for mercy, for I find it somewhat absurd to ask for mercy for something I did not do. So I will be tortured for and will suffer for and receive the pain for that act. But I will not share the burden for the guilt. In imposing sentence, Judge Cowart cited the savagery of the crimes and what he called the indifference of the defendant. This court independent of, but in agreement with. This guy's last name is Cowart. <laughs> the advisory sentence rendered by the jury does hereby impose the death penalty upon the defendant Theodore Robert Bundy. 
Then, in an unexpected move, perhaps an afterthought, Cowart stunned the courtroom with some parting words for Bundy. Take care of yourself, young man. Thank you. All right, I'll say that to you sincerely. Take care of yourself. It's a tragedy for this court to see it's such a total waste, I think, of humanity that I've experienced in this court. You're a bright young man. You made a good lawyer. I'd love to have you practice in front of me, but you went another way, partner. Bundy says he'll appeal. Meanwhile, he has been ordered to the state prison to await setting of the date of his execution in the election. Yeah, bro. I mean, what do you what do you mean when we say this shit? Like, I'm not pulling this out of my ass. Here, status and race in the Stanford rape case. Why Brock Turner's mugshot matters. Here is uh, Canadians also getting in on the fun. A black woman let her child play in the park next to where she worked. This is the image the media circulated. Her fucking mugshot. A white man raped an unconscious woman in an alley behind a dumpster. This is the image media circulated. His Stanford yearbook picture. If you don't think that this is a reinforcement of white supremacist implicit biases that are uh, inside of like every fucking person, I don't know what to tell you. That's the buff we're talking about. Outrage over Stanford rape sentence. Like, the, what the fuck? Now, if you want, the way to fix this is not by showing white dudes in mugshots. The way to fix this is by showing everyone in, uh, you know, better moments, I guess. Especially when it's not a fucking person that has done, like, an insane, unimaginable crime. Or, in most instances, a black victim of police brutality. Black people, even when they're fucking victims of police brutality, are still and were until like uh, a, a lot of the media changed their their uh, overall way of covering these events. And that is like a new thing for the record. They used to treat literal victims of police brutality and police violence like they were also the actual perpetrators when they weren't. They recently changed it too, like a couple of years ago. So, understand that this is a relatively new process. Anyway, let's take a look at what the judge is saying here. Cause number CR 2922-2805. Mr. Koberger is present in court. He is in custody. He is appearing with his attorney, Ms. Taylor. Mr. Thompson, Ms. Jennings, on behalf of the state. This is the time set in the matter for initial appearance. Mr. Koberger, I am going to advise you of the rights that you have in this case. I am going to go over the criminal complaint with you, and then we're going to discuss setting the matter for further hearing. You have the following rights. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. You have the right to the presumption of innocence. That means the state bears the burden to prove that you are guilty of this offense beyond a reasonable doubt. You have the right to a preliminary hearing. A preliminary hearing is a probable cause hearing. At that hearing, the state must establish that more likely than not, these felony offenses were committed and you were the one that committed the felony offenses. You have a right to have that hearing within 14 days if you remain in custody. If you are bound over at that preliminary hearing to district court, if the court finds probable cause, you would be bound over to district court. And at that time, you can enter a plea of not guilty and you can have a jury trial set within six months of your appearance in district court. At both your preliminary hearing and your jury trial, you have the right to confront and oh my God. any evidence or witnesses. Oh, my God. Instead of adjourning, they're going for an 11th speaker vote. They're going for another one. To the one that will be elected next, Kevin McCarthy. The role of Speaker of the House is one of the most beloved in America. They're going history. for another one. The Speaker's mission is to carry out the principled goals and objectives of him. Okay, I don't care about this shit. All right, Call let's continue. You. Call witnesses on your own behalf and compel witnesses to be present and testify at the state's expense. You have the right to be represented by a lawyer. If you cannot afford one, one could be appointed to represent you based upon your financial need. You also have the right to appeal any conviction in your case. Do you understand these rights? Yes. I am now gonna go over the criminal complaint with you. Count one of the criminal complaint charges you with the felony offense of burglary. It alleges that the defendant, Brian C. Koberger, on or about November 13th of 2022, in Laytaw County, state of Idaho, did unlawfully enter a residence located at 1122 King Road, Moscow, with the intent to commit the felony crime of murder in violation of Idaho. 
spoke with the later county sheriff. He says he has heard nothing out of the ordinary with Kohlberger in the jail so far. He says they are trying to accommodate Kohlberger's vegan diet restrictions, but we are not going to buy new pots and pans or anything like that. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, my God. You mean it's oh, another vegan, dude? Jesus Christ. Okay, listen, listen. Vegans are very kind individuals, okay? I'm not going to shit on... I'm not going to shit on vegans right now. Uh, and... And, and make fun of them with an easy dunk here. Especially as Austin Ox has launched the, the year of positive Hasanabi PR, okay? The year of Hasanabi positivity is upon us. I'm not going to fucking uh, attack one of my main advocates here. This vegan it does not represent all vegans. It's funny, though, because he's like... <laughs> like... It's funny that that they're even talking about like special accommodations. Like they don't do that for anybody. It's American prison, man. It's literally fucking a violation of human rights uh, for for everyone, regardless of how severe the crime is. You know what I mean? They don't make accommodate. They they're he's in prison. He's fucked. Don't you think that if you've murdered four people, the whole idea of being vegan is kind of out the window? Yeah, I don't understand like what your, what your, what your ethical conundrum is there. You killed humans without consent, but like you're like, hey, but you know, a, a slice of cheese—that's the real murder. Like, what the fuck? At that point, just eat meat, dog. You know what I mean? What the fuck are you doing? Code eighteen dash one four zero one and one four zero three. The maximum penalty for that offense, if you plead guilty or are found guilty, is not less than one year in prison, no more than 10 years in prison, and or a $50,000 fine or both. Do you understand? Yes. Count two alleges that you committed the felony offense of murder in the first degree. It alleges that the defendant, Ryan C. Koberger, on or about November 13th, 2022, in Latak County, State of Idaho, did willfully, unlawfully, deliberately, with premeditation and with malice aforethought, kill and murder Madison Mogan, a human being, by stabbing Madison Mogan from which she died. In violation of Idaho Code 18-4001, 4002, 4003, and 4004. The maximum penalty for this offense, if you were to plead guilty or be found guilty, is death or imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. Count three alleges that you committed the felony offense of murder in the first degree. It alleges that the defendant, Brian C. Koberger, on or about November 13th of 2022 in Latak County, State of Idaho, did willfully, unlawfully, deliberately, with premeditation, and with malice of forethought. Okay, so this is his, like, it, that, that stuff is, like, kind of irrelevant. But there are new investigative details on a timeline... Here's Madison Mogan and Kaylee Con Kells. Uh, wait, is there no audio? What the fuck? On the night of. Oh, it's a food truck. Yeah, Madison Mogan and Kaylee Guncalves. Guncalves. I'm saying their last name wrong. The dude following them, where and who is he? What do you mean? Gonzalez? This is from a Twitch stream by the food truck? Wait, really? This is the Twitch stream food truck? Oh my god. I've seen that food truck before. This is the video from the food truck Twitch stream the night of new investigative details released on Thursday provide the first clear view of the apparent movements of the man accused of killing four University of Idaho students in the early morning hours of November 13 and 1 45 a.m. After spending several hours at a frat party to the victims, Zaina Kernadal and her boyfriend, Ethan Chapin returned to the off campus house. Miss Kernadal shared with several roommates, including two of the other victims. 
At 1.56 a.m., the other victims, Kaylee Consalves and Madison Mogan, arrive back at the house after spending time at a bar and grabbing food at a food truck. 2.47 a.m., a phone belonging to the suspect, Brian Kohlberger, stops connecting to the cell phone network in Pullman, Washington, where he lives, a short drive from the University of Idaho campus in Moscow. 2.53 a.m., surveillance footage shows a white sedan consistent with a white Hyundai Elantra registered to Kohlberger traveling towards the highway between Pullman and Moscow. 3.29 a.m., surveillance video shows what police say is a white Hyundai Elantra in the Moscow neighborhood that includes the victim's house where the crime later occurred. The vehicle makes three passes by the house. One of the victims at 4 a.m., one of the victims, Zena Kernadl, receives a DoorDash delivery at home, according to investigators. At about the same time, another occupant of the house is awakened by what she thinks is an upstairs roommate playing with her dog, according to her statement to the police. At 4.04 a.m., video shows of Elantra returning to the area for a fourth time, at one point doing a three-point turn in the roadway near the house. At 4.12 a.m., Kernadl uses the TikTok app, app on her phone, uh, her phone record, record suggests. The downstairs roommate is also awake. Sometime after 4 a.m., she tells investigators she hears what sounds like crying coming from Kernado's room. When she opens her door, she hears a male voice telling someone something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you. So one of the victims uh, who, uh, I guess, survived uh, saw the, the murderer, allegedly. And he presented himself as like a random person in the middle of the night, who a hooded figure with, I believe, bushy eyebrows or something, uh, saying that they were there to help. 4.17 a.m., a security camera from a nearby residence picks up distorted audio of what sounds like a whimper and a loud thud. A dog can be heard barking numerous times at some point, and exactly when is unclear. The roommate... Wait, um... Fuck. The roommate opens her bedroom door again. According to the account she gave investigators and sees a man with bushy eyebrows clad in black clothing and a mask. The man walks past her towards a sliding uh, door on the second floor. She goes back into her room and locks the door, and it is unclear what she does during the next several hours. At 4.20 a.m., the white Elantra is seen leaving the neighborhood at a high rate of speed. At 4.48 a.m., Kohlberger's phone reconnects the cell network south of Moscow near Blaine, Idaho. At 5.30 a.m., after traveling in the area south of Moscow, Kohlberger's phone is detected back in Pullman. At 9.12 a.m., Kohlberger's phone returns to Moscow and connects to the cellular network near the scene of the murders. It stays there until 9.21 a.m. before returning to the area of his home in Pullman. So he went back to the scene of the crime. At 12 a.m., 11.58 a.m., a 911 call reports an unconscious person at the scene of the killings, triggering a response from law enforcement. He visited the King's residence 12 times before the murders. This is the official probable cause affidavit. Zana Kernoodle, the person with the TikTok app open, also died. It's super common for killers to go back to their crime scene. Yeah. They waited seven hours to call the cops. This timeline looks weird. So here's the thing. Okay? Here's the thing. It's late at night. People are fucking drunk. There's a lot of activity inside of a house. You might assume that someone is just like a partier. You know what I mean? She probably fucking saw some dude... Went, oh, like, you know, someone is having a person over and, and decided to go back to sleep. It's normal. So when they woke up, that's when they figured out, oh, shit, like, the people in the house are dead. Bro, someone's in my house. I don't know. I'm asking questions. Okay, a lot of you have never lived in, like, a shared living space in college, and it shows. They're, like, drunk as fuck. I don't know. The only thing that doesn't make sense is why one of the victims that survived didn't call the cops after she like hid in her room. Like hiding is one thing, but not actually calling. Uh, like, I don't know why. I don't know why she didn't call the cops and like lock the door and then uh, and, and not call the cops. But again, you could chalk it up to someone basically thinking, you know, there's like a random dude in the house. Someone brought them in. It's a place where people go to party to do after parties. Yeah, this was, she probably thought he was just a lost dude or some shit. This was right before break party week. Yeah. 
if you have ever, if you've been to college, if you've had like a shared living space with other people, if you see some sketch dude at the party, but it's like 4 a.m. and you think like it's like a booty call or something, you know what I mean? There's a million different reasons why a random person could be at your house. The only reason, the only thing that's weird is like you just are locking your door in a panic. And that is what's, um, you know, that's, that's what's surprising about it. Like the loud thud, it, it like he, it doesn't make sense that like, um, it doesn't make sense that the things that don't make complete sense in that situation is just like the roommate opening her bedroom door again, according to the account she gave investigators and sees a man with bushy eyebrows clad in black clothing and a mask. The man walks past towards her a sliding glass door on the second floor. She goes back into her room and locks the door and it is unclear what she does during the next several hours. Dude, if you think someone is sketch, but you don't want to call the cops, I'd 100% lock my door too and go back to my business. That's what I'm saying. Like at this stage, it might be unclear to the cops, uh, to the investigators, what she did. And mask wise, it doesn't mean that the killer had a fucking, you know, uh, nightmare on Elm Street or whatever the fuck, like Freddy Krueger mask. Do the do either of those guys? Jason, not a hockey mask. It's not a scream mask. It's probably just a mask mask. Even if it's literally a fucking balaclava, okay. Even if it's not like a COVID mask. Even if it's a ski mask. They're in Idaho, brother. It's cold as a motherfucker. Like, even if he had a fucking ski mask on or a balaclava on, you you might not have even thought about it. You know what I mean? Dylan Mortensen said she first woke up around 4 a.m. to what she assumed was the sound of her roommate playing with her dog upstairs. A short time later, Mortensen thought she heard the 21-year-old friend say, there's someone here. But when Mortensen looked out of her bedroom, she didn't see a thing. She peeked outside her bedroom door a second time when she heard crying coming from the bedroom of her other roommate, Zana Carnoodle. It's okay, I'm going to help you, Mortensen told authorities. She heard a male voice say, the third time Mortison opened her bedroom door, a far more terrifying sight, a figure clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. But the masked man just walked past her and left the home through the back sliding glass door as she stood there frozen in shock. Hours later, Mortison would learn that three of her roommates and one of their boyfriends had been brutally murdered. Do you get it? That, that, does that paint a clearer picture for you? She hears someone crying. Um, she probably thought like it was an altercation or something with like a fucking shitty dude or, you know what I mean? Like there was a million different reasons as to why this could have gone down the way it did. Brother, the roommate that saw him went back in a room, fainted, passed out. And the last roommate found her and reported her unconscious to the police. The dude was wearing a black COVID mask. It's in the affidavit. <sighs> if these videos are him, I can 100% deduce exactly the kind of man he is. I mean, you know. That's according to it. Oh, here. The third time Mortensen opened her bedroom door. Uh, we already covered that. Okay. Here's the affidavit. I mean, we covered literally all the details of this, basically. And this part is redacted. But here. 4 p.m. Moscow Police Department Sergeant Blaker and I responded to 1122 King Road, Moscow, Idaho. Hereafter, King Road residence to assist with the scene security and processing of a crime scene. Officer Smith and I entered... King Road residence to the bottom floor. This part is like boring and bullshit. Also in the room was a uh, male later identified as Ethan Chapin here. Which, uh, um, just like cop shit. Based on numerous interviews conducted by MPD officers, ISB detectives, and the FBI agents, as well as uh, my review of the evidence, I've learned the following. Okay, they were at the Sigma Chi house on Idaho campus uh, at approximately 9 p.m. till 1.45, approximately. At 1.45, they returned to the King Road residence, Chapin and Kernodal. Uh BF also stated that Chapin did not live at the King's Road residence, but was a guest of Kernodal. Uh Gon Calves and Mogan were at a local bar at the Corner Club. They're on video footage uh, provided by Corner Club between 10 p.m. and 1.30 a.m. At approximately 1.30 a.m., uh, Concalves and, and, and Mogan go to the food uh, vendor called the Grub Truck, who is a Twitch streamer as well. I've seen videos of their uh, uh, of their truck before. Wild that it would be like a part of this murder investigation. A private party reported that he provided a ride to Kunkals and Mogan ex uh, approximately at 2 a.m. from downtown Moscow in front of the grub truck to the King Road residence. DM and BF both made statements during interviews that indicated the occupants of the King's Road residence were by home. 
or at home by 2 a.m. and a sleeper at least in their rooms by approximately 4 a.m. This is with the exception of Kernodal, who received a DoorDash order at the residence approximately at 4 a.m. Law enforcement identified the DoorDash delivery driver who reported this information. DM stated she originally went to sleep in her bedroom on the southeast side of the second floor. DM stated she was also awoken approximately at 4 a.m. by what she stated sounded like uh, Gonsalves, Gonsalves playing with her dog in one of the upstairs bedrooms, which were located on the third floor. A short time later, DM said she heard who she thought was Gonsalves say something to the effect of, there's someone here. A review of records obtained from a forensic download of Kernodal's phone <coughs> showed this could also have been Kernodal on her cellular phone indicated she was likely awake and using TikTok app approximately at 4.12 a.m. DM stated she looked out of her bedroom but did not see anything when she heard the comment about someone being in the house. DM stated she opened her door a second time when she heard what she thought was crying coming from Kernaldo's room. DM then said she heard a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you. At approximately 4 a.m., a security camera located at uh, Kings Road, a residence immediately to the northwest, picked up distorted audio of what sounded like voices or a whimper, followed by a loud thud. A dog can also be heard barking numerous times starting at 4 a.m. The security camera is less than 50 feet from the west wall of Kernodal's bedroom. DM stated she opened her door for the third time after she heard the crying and saw a figure clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. DM described the figure as a 5'10 or taller male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock phase. The male walked towards the backsliding glass door. DM locked herself in her room after seeing the male. DM did not state that she recognized the male. This leads investigators to believe that the murderer had left the scene. The combination of DM statements to law enforcement, reviews of forensic downloads records from BF and DM's phone, and a video of a suspect video is described below, leads investigators to believe the homicides occurred between 4 a.m. and 4.25 a.m. So, basically what happened, uh, and, and uh, my assessment, okay, is... Because if you're, if you're like, oh, that's so weird, why didn't she fucking immediately call the cops? And that's your first uh, uh, idea. There are multiple reasons for it. One, it's like a shared living space in a college town... There are plenty of fucking random, like, weird losers that uh, one of your girlfriends or one of your guy friends might have invited. So it was, like, enough for her to feel uncomfortable about the situation to lock her door, but not so uncomfortable that she thought, oh, we should call the cops uh, to this, you know. The weirdest part is the 4 a.m. DoorDash delivery. That is not a weird part at all. What the fuck are you talking about? It's a college town, okay? For you to think like nothing is open 24-7 at a college town, that's weird that you think that, okay? It is a perfectly normal uh, experience. I guess timeline-wise, it's like so close to like the actual fucking dude walking into the house and committing the murders while uh, the DoorDash was happening. That's the, that's the unique component here, but not necessarily weird. Like... If you're saying that, then that's understandable. Can you click the three lines on the top right corner to hide the side panel? What? Oh, and then zoom in here. Wait, so they just thought he was a friend of someone chilling with them? I mean, we will never know until she actually, like, gives more uh, testimony on the matter. Ultimately, um, we will... I mean, we won't know, uh, but I would assume that the reason why she didn't is because she personally thought she probably thought that there was just like another random weird dude in the house. People come in and out of places like that. Okay. People come in and out of places like that regularly. Oftentimes, uh, you know, they're invited or whatever the fuck, you know what I mean? Yeah. I had a friend's house that never locked their door. I just show up anytime. She probably thought it was a guy they met at the bar or something. Yeah, exactly. During the process of the crime scene, investigators found a latent shoe print. This was located during the second processing of the crime scene by the ISP forensic team by first using a presumptive blood test, then amino black, a protein, that stain, a protein stain that detects the presence of cellular material. To detect the shoe print showed a diamond-shaped pattern, similar to the pattern of a van's type shoe sole, just outside the door of DM's bedroom located on the second floor. This is consistent with DM's statement regarding the suspect's path of travel. As a part of the investigation, an extensive search, commonly referred to law enforcement as a video canvas, was conducted in the area of the King Road residence. This video canvas was obtained was to obtain any footage from the early morning hours of November 13 in the area of King Road residence and surrounding neighborhoods in an effort to locate the suspects or suspect vehicles traveling to or leaving from King Road residence. 
This video cam has resulted in the collection of numerous surveillance videos in the area from both residential business addresses. They looked at all of that. A review of the camera footage indicated that a white sedan, suspect vehicle one, was observed traveling westbound on 700 block on Indian Hills uh, Drive in Moscow. Approximately at 3.26 a.m. westbound on Steiner Avenue. These are all like, you know, roads, so I'm not going to fucking go through them uh, in detail because, you know, you don't know any better anyway because you're not from the neighborhood. The weird part is that the suspect actually circled, again, circled the house four times, including doing a K-turn in a nearby uh, neighborhood driveway. It stopped and turned around the front of 500 Queen Road, number 52, and then driving back westbound on King Road. When suspect vehicle one was in front of the Kings Road residence, it appeared unsuccessfully to attempt to park or turn around the road. This is important to understand the, the, vic, the, the, the motivation of the, of the perpetrator. Because why did they choose that house? Do they, does he know anything about the individuals in the house? Why specifically that house? You know what I mean? Is there premeditation? Is he just like a freak? I don't know. Suspect vehicle one is seen departing the area of the Kings Road residence at approximately 4.20 a.m. at the rate of high speed. Suspect vehicle one is the next observed traveling southbound on Walenta Drive. Law enforcement officers provided video footage of suspect vehicle one to forensic examiners of the FBI that regularly utilize surveillance footage to identify year, make, model of an unknown vehicle that is observed by one or more cameras. The forensics examiner... His approximately 35 years of law enforcement experience and 12 years of the FBI. His specific training includes identifying unique characteristics of vehicles, and he uses a database. After reviewing the uh, vehicle, they figured out that it was a 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra. Upon further review, he indicated it could also be a 2011 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra. As a result, investigators have been reviewing information on persons in the possession of a vehicle that is a 2011 to 2016 white Hyundai Elantra. They looked at the WSU campus in Pullman, it feels like they should be calling into question his father as well. Because what I don't understand about this is like his dad seemingly is involved as a, as, as like at the very least, uh, you know, helping, aiding and abetting him. But I don't know. Like an accomplice? Was there not a, was he not in the car? Does this have any TOS photos in it? This affidavit? He wasn't in the car. But investigators believe that Kohlberger is still driving the 2015 white Elantra because the vehicle was captured on December 13th by a license plate reader in Loma, Colorado. Kohlberger's Elantra was then queried on December 15th by law enforcement in Hancock County, Indiana. On December 16, 2022, approximately at 2.26 p.m., Surveillance video showed Kohlberger's Elantra in Albertsville, Pennsylvania. The sole occupant of the vehicle was a white male whose description was consistent with Kohlberger and his family in Pennsylvania. Based on information provided by the WSU website, Kohlberger is currently a PhD student in criminology uh, at Washington State University. He's a TA. We learned that Kohlberger's past education included undergraduate degrees in psychology and cloud-based forensics. His records also show that Kohlberger wrote an essay when he applied for an internship with the Pullman Police Department in the fall of 2022. Kohlberger wrote in his essay that he had interest in assisting rural law enforcement agencies with, no, with how to better collect and analyze technological data in public safety operations. He was, you know, criminology PhD, wanted to be a cop. He also posted a Reddit survey, which can be found on open source internet search. The survey asked for participants to provide information. We already talked about this before. Uh, to understand how emotions and psychological traits influence decision making when committing a crime. So they determined that Kohlberger was associated with both 2015 White Elantra and the 8458 phone. Investigators reviewed these search warrant returns. The query of the 8458 phone in these terms in these returns did not show it. Utilizing cellular cellular towers in close proximity to King Road residence between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. because he turned his phone off. Based on my training experience and conversations with law enforcement officers that specialize in the utilization of cellular telephone records as a part of investigations. Individuals can either leave their cellular telephone at a different location before committing a crime or turn their cellular telephone off prior to going to a location to commit a crime. This is done by subjects in effort to avoid alerting law enforcement that a cellular device associated with them was in a particular area when the crime was committed. Like pretty basic stuff. But also at the same time, um, it's not really five head because when you kill someone with a knife, and this is like true crime 101, you know, you don't even need to be a fucking... You don't even need to be a, a uh, you know, 
a, a, a PhD student to understand this. True Crime 101, if you kill someone with a knife, your DNA is going to be left on the scene. It's very difficult to kill someone with a knife without leaving any DNA. So if he understood this, it's wild that he did not understand. He also used his own fucking car. Anyway, this is done by subjects in an effort to alert, uh, avoid alerting law enforcement. On December 23rd, I applied for uh, and was granted a search warrant for historical phone records. Accounts been opened since June 23rd. These records also included historical cell site information. He consulted with the FBI to, to fucking trace the phone to cell towers. And he was utilizing cellular resources on the night of the murder at 242 um, that provide coverage to the 1630 Northeast Valley Road in Pullman, okay, in his house at 247. The phone utilized cellular resources that uh, provide coverage to the southeast of the Kohlberger residence, consistent with the A458 phone. So he left and traveled south through Pullman, Washington, which is consistent with the movement of the white Elantra. At 247, the phone stops reporting to the network. So the phone either was in an area without cellular coverage, which could happen because it's like some backwater podunk town shit, you know what I mean? Uh, shouts out to America. Or... Because he turned it off. He does not report to the network until approximately 4.48 a.m., which was near Blaine, Idaho, north of Genesee, which means that he definitely turned it off because he went to an area where there was internet, as we know, because the car was caught in the, in the neighborhood. So the car was there. But his phone was no longer accessing services, which means he turned his phone off. Yeah, but you do lose drivers in that area. I know, but not the area, not the college town, though. When he got to Moscow, he should have actually fucking uh, gotten cell coverage again. So he then travels back. Uh, further review indicated that the cellular resources were utilized that are consistent, leaving the Kohlberger residence. Traveling to Moscow, specifically the phone, utilize cellular resources that would provide coverage to King Road residents between 9 a.m. and 9.21 a.m. 9.12 a.m. and 9.21, which means he went back to the scene of the fucking murder. The 8458 phone next utilized cellular resources that are consistent with the 8458 phone traveling back to Kohlberger residence. He literally went back to his house, came back to the scene of the crime, which is a classic. It's a classic fucking true crime uh, moment right there. Went back to the fucking scene of the crime. I don't understand why they haven't subpoenaed the dad's phone. That's crazy. Yeah, here it is. Here's the possible route based on cellular device location. So he took the long, like, backwater way over there. To, I guess, cover his trail. To cover his tracks. Huh. What makes you think the dad was involved? The dad was in PA? I guess if his dad was, why are you so suspicious? I don't know why. I feel like, I feel like this is not like a one man operation. I'm getting like weird vibes from it. Maybe the dad wasn't involved. It's fucked up of me to even speculate. But anyway, uh, this is just like the pathways that he took, all this stuff. Additional analysis show, and this is his escape basically. On December 27th, Pennsylvania agents recovered the trash from the Kohlberger family residence located in Albrightsville, PA. The evidence was sent to the Idaho State Lab for testing. On December 28th, the Idaho State Lab reported that a DNA profile obtained for the trash and the DNA profile obtained from the sheath identified as a male, not being excluded as the biological father of the suspect profile. At least 99.9% .9 of the male population wouldn't be expected to be excluded from the possibility of the suspect's uh, biological father. So... He didn't mention the phone being at the location 12 times since June. Oh, I don't know. He was giving cops full details of where they were going and coming from and saying how Brian was a PhD student at WSU when they were pulled over. So this is actually an interesting uh, take as well, which is like unique. The stab to death four people that were only in two rooms means he stabbed one person to death with another living person, not one, but twice. It's very difficult to do without waking anyone up or screaming. But I guess given the fact that it's a college town and it's like super late in the night, they might have uh, thought that the altercation was simply, again, like one of the roommates playing with her dog or something. But it is crazy. But yeah, being drunk as fuck, 
And in under 20 minutes, like, it's crazy. Here's the body camera footage of the son and dad traffic stop, by the way. Recording. Hello. How you doing? How y'all doing today? Good, good. Take a look at your driver's license real quick, if I could. See, he's right up on that van, man. It's not a frat house, but it is a shared living space. It's not a frat house. It's a shared living space for a bunch of college. It's an off-campus house where a bunch of college students were living together. It wasn't a frat house. Step on the back end of that van. Hold you over for tailgating. Is this your car? Okay. Cool. Where are you headed? Well, we come from WSU. Uh, What's WSU? Uh, well, yeah, I, I go to university, basically. That is Boston area. Yeah, the, uh, Carter also states the house is 100 feet from Greek Row. It's a live out. Yeah. It's just a lot of people who are in fraternities, as one of the victims was will often not want to live in the frat house, but there are plenty of shared houses that you can live in that's like close enough in proximity to the frat houses. So that is literally the reason why. Some of them will be satellite houses if there's like plenty of people that are from one particular frat living there. Um, you know, so basically that could be part of the reason uh, uh, why. I can't believe I'm like describing it. Like in a college town, it, it, there are shared living spaces where you live in, okay, where, you know, weird shit is happening and you don't even think twice about it because you're drunk, you know? So we're, okay, I, I'm having a hard time hearing you because of the traffic. So you're coming from Washington State University? Yeah. And you're going where? Uh oh. We're going to be going to Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. We're a little, we're slightly clutching because we're driving for hours. Hours, days. Hours to drive. Yeah. Well, yeah. Almost a day. Okay. So what did you say about some SWAT team thing? Or yeah, something? there was, yeah, there was the mass shooting, shooting and everything. We where? At this point, they're looking for this Hyundai Elantra, though, which is why it's strange that this cop pulled them over for, like, a shitty charge, like, tailgating. Like, they were literally looking for it. There's a, what is it called? Like, an APB? Like, they they were absolutely looking for and knew that they were looking for a fucking uh, Hyundai Elantra. There's a nationwide search. And tailgating is such a, a bolo. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a nationwide search bolo. Be on the lookout. And I don't know. I don't know why they just like were not even sussed out even a little bit. Like it's, it fits the fucking profile. An APB is an all points bulletin. Yes, both of them are technically correct. An APB you put out on like a, on the suspect, and then um, I don't know. I I just don't know how the fuck like. Yeah, the tailgating was an excuse to pull them over without alerting them. Enables the cop to suss them out. I know, but it's also like. It's, it's, uh, but the cop clearly didn't suss him correctly. Interesting. Well, it's horrifying because he's just going to the university. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, so y'all work at the university there? I actually do work there. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't heard about that incident just yesterday or? No, it just happened this morning. About, about an hour and a half ago, we're still wrapping it up for investigating. I was not sure the solution is. Holy fuck, they're talking about, they're talking about the fucking murder, dude. What the fuck? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't heard. The FBI dispelled the rumor this was involved. 
Okay, so, he, but there's no, why would a fucking random cop pull someone over for tailgating? Like, that's a ridiculous charge to pull someone over. Especially when they, they released this, they stopped him intentionally, they want a footage evidence of his hands and wounds. No, there were two stops, I believe. But also, it doesn't even fucking matter. Like, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, you get pulled over for dumb shit all the time. They have quotas and stuff. But this is a, this is the car that a suspect used in a murder. You know, it, it's a car that matches the description of the car that they're looking for perfectly. They will stop that car for one reason or the other. An out-of-state license plate and shit? Come on. And no, the father is not implicated as an accessory to the crime. They, they, they basically said he was innocent. Heard about that incident just yesterday or? No, it just happened this morning. About an hour and a half ago, we're still wrapping it up. And they're talking about, this is not one hour after the news, bro. It's the 15th of December, brother. The murders happened on November 13th. We knew about the murders at least a week after the murders had happened. Everybody knew about it. I remember not even covering it that much because the cops literally just said, yeah, we don't know what's going on. They're not talking about the murders. Wait, what? Really? Oh, they were talking about a shooting. Did a shooting happen? Oh, fuck, dude. Jesus Christ. America. I'm not sure this shooting, if they did shoot somebody. Let's see. And then we don't know about that actually. Well, the interesting. Wow. Well, okay. Well, do me a favor and don't follow too close, okay? Oh. All right. Sure. Thank you. So Appreciate you. Bro, that is insane. What a what an interaction. Hey, have a great day, sir. Here, I'll throw the fucking lights on for you so you can get to your place. Have a good day. The amount of times, especially in, like, New Jersey, where I've been pulled over for some dumb shit by, like, a fucking cop in uh, a, a uh, non-identifiable car, like, a, not a cruiser. Jesus Christ, dude. I've gotten a fucking ticket for not wearing a seatbelt in the back seat of a car in West Hollywood, okay? In the back seat of a car, which I didn't even know was, like, the law. If cops want to fucking get you on something, they'll get you, okay? They'll fucking get you. It's crazy. I mean, don't be a prick not wearing a seatbelt. Brother, we're... <laughs> People that say this do not understand. First of all, you should wear a seatbelt in the backseat of a car. But you've never been to West Hollywood. You will never be able to drive faster than 15 miles an hour on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood. So you're out of your fucking mind. Like the place where I got the place where I got fucking uh, nabbed and got hit with a ticket uh, for not wearing a seatbelt in the backseat of a car was in bumper to bumper fucking traffic on Santa Monica, literally in West Hollywood, like right across from I still remember it. It was a fucking it was a uh, it was a bike. It was a bike cop like on a, you know, on a motorbike um, in the backseat of a car. I don't remember what the fucking, I don't remember what the ticket was, but like, it was insane, dude. It was insane. Like, there's no way to scope that out. Like, it's one of those things where like, no one is capable of scoping that out unless it's bumper to bumper traffic. You know what I mean? How the fuck could a cop tell you you weren't wearing a fucking seatbelt in the backseat of your car? The only time where they can fucking figure that out is if it is bumper to bumper traffic. The cop literally looked in to the car, saw me not wearing a seatbelt in the backseat of the car, and decided this is a good opportunity to fucking generate some revenue. It's so dumb. Speaking of generating revenue, the top of the hour ad break is upon us, which at the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe. Man, cops are fucking awesome. Just so sick. Have a good day now. Here's more details from Krem2 News. Brian Koberger faced a judge for the first time in Latah County. He faces first degree murder charges accused of killing four University of Idaho students. Just hours ago, officials also released the affidavit that lays out new evidence. It also reveals a new timeline of events. We now know how investigators say they were able to link Koberger's DNA to the gruesome crime scene. 
But first, let's go to Amanda Rowley. She has been at the Lata County Courthouse all morning long. She was in the room as Koberger faced an Idaho judge. Oh, fuck. I forgot to run the ad break. I'm running it now. Sorry. We still do not have an understanding of the motive, okay? <sighs> We still do not know what the motive is. Good afternoon. Just to be transparent, there was quite a line of media members to get into this. Abigeen, 19. When Thank you in, for the five get the subs. Hearing, and it was completely full of members of the media. But sitting in the front row were family I'm members of Kaylee Gonzalez, who is one of the murdered University of Idaho students. Now, during this hearing, the suspect showed no emotion and spoke very little, meaning he only spoke when the judge asked him questions. Now the judge read through each charge against Brian Koberger, one count of burglary and four counts of murder. The max penalty as the judge read in court today for each count of murder in the first degree is death or life in prison. Cooney County's chief public defender Ann Taylor is representing the suspect. Koberger is currently being held in Lataw County Jail with no bail and this morning his attorney argued against this. But the prosecutor Bill Thompson told the judge Idaho law does not entitled the suspect to a bond because of the charges against him, adding that he was arrested across the country. The judge decided Koberger will remain in jail without bail. She also gave the suspect a no contact order. That means it's he's prohibited from having any contact with the victim's families, friends and the surviving roommates. Now, shortly after the hearing this morning, the attorney representing the Gonzalez family commented on their behalf. Take a listen. It's obviously an emotional time for the family, seeing the defendant for the first time. Um, this is the beginning of the criminal justice system, and the family will, will be here for the long haul. And that's the statement for the media today. Thank you. Wake up. Now, here's what we can expect in the upcoming court proceedings. A status conference hearing is now scheduled for next Thursday at 10 a.m. And this was at the request of the suspect's defense attorney. From today, Koberger's preliminary hearing must happen within the next two weeks. And during that hearing, he will have to enter a plea of either not guilty or guilty. We'll be keeping track of that and posting any updates we can as we learn more. Reporting from. Ladies and gentlemen, a uh, quick update Look on what's going on. Here, that they want Kevin Republican McCarthy has lost the 11th vote in the speaker standoff. Failing on both missions. McCarthy is hoping caving to key demands. From the he has lost the 11th vote, the 11th L. Holy shit, dude. I mean, retire at this point. Retire, 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 retire. Just fuck it. How many more times, Kevin? How many more times can a man withstand L after L after L after L?